Next, a beekeeper from Chile fights a world bee crisis. A Zambian businesswoman helps rural farmers improve their lives. And a North Korean defector helps his fellow refugees. All examples of the power people have to make significant change when finally given the chance. Major funding for the following program was provided by Donald and Paula Smith Family Foundation. Additional funding was provided by David and Annette Jorgensen Foundation and Chris and Melody Roofer. We were seven girls in the family and uh, one boy. And this boy was the last born. The fellow villagers uh, kept on laughing at my father. I started asking myself, I said, is it a crime to be born a girl? So it was from that time I declared anything that a man can do, I can also do it. <laughs> in South Korea, everyone is entitled to have a dream which is a huge difference from North Korea. You may say it is heaven and hell. We are still very young. Every country, you know, needs a lot of years to get the old bad stuff out and, you know, change it for something which is better or good. If I make a decision and if it's not the best one, then I'm the one who is going to suffer. So. This was the tough part that I didn't think before. We have three children and we have to make efforts for their sake. We fight for them, to give them something better, to give them a better future. A better future. That's a goal all of these people, indeed all of us, have in common. In a moment, we'll share their remarkable human stories of survival, triumph, and lives in transition. There are also stories of nations transforming themselves in ways that are allowing people to rise out of poverty and take control of their own future. From Zambia to South Korea. From Slovakia to Chile. Newfound economic freedom is changing lives. I'm Johan Norberg, and I've been studying economic freedom for decades. What is it, and what impact does it have on people's lives? In the last 100 years, the world has created more wealth, reduced poverty more, and increased life expectancy more than in the 10,000 years before. Since the beginning of recorded history until the year 1800, the average person's income barely changed, but in the 200 years since, they increased by 2,000%. How did that happen, and what role did economic freedom play? I'm here in Montreal, Canada, outside the offices of the Fraser Institute, whose work on economic freedom has become the gold standard used by economists, researchers, and policymakers around the world. The Institute has developed an objective way of measuring the economic freedom of a country, and they've created a report that I've often used myself in my writings and lectures. But the economic freedom of the world report is not just about numbers and charts and graphs. No, it's really about people. People who want the opportunity to work hard, to become self-sufficient and independent, and to improve their quality of life. Our story begins in the African Republic of Zambia. In 1995, this landlocked nation was one of the lowest-ranked countries in the Fraser Report. But today, Zambia is one of the most economically free nations in Africa. In just 15 years, this impoverished African nation has increased its economic freedom to a level comparable to Poland and France, opening doors for people like Sylvia Banda. I started business at the age of 12. I was making fritters and I put them in the basket, take them to school. I sell them to my friends, it would make me very happy. After working her way through college, Sylvia's first official business was to open a small, one-room restaurant. 
I didn't have anyone to go around and tell the people that uh, that particular day I was opening the restaurant. So I started frying onions, which I brought from home, the garlic and green pepper. And each time I uh, fry, fry, I cover it. Then I uh, put a bit of water, again I'll cover it, I'll allow the steam to come out, again I cover it, until uh, the whole place was covered with uh, steam. Then I went to the windows I opened, I went to the door I opened, and I could see the steam uh, rushing to go out. Very nice scent. Then five, ten minutes later, people started coming. Mm, mm, we have felt a very nice scent. At lunch hour, people started coming, and I was very, very happy. Then after some time, I saw that people were standing with their plates in their hands. Then I realized, I said, oh, I made a very big mistake. I had no tables and chairs. <laughs> Sylvia quickly realized there was more to running a restaurant than cooking food. But with no money, she had only her creativity. So I went to my neighbor who was in carpentry. I said, Patrick, supposing I started uh, giving you free meals, three every day, says in return, I said, in return, you make me one chair. So straight away, we started the butter system. From this modest one-room beginning, Sylvia Banda expanded her business to include extensive catering, a school for restaurant service workers, and the processing and nationwide distribution of Zambian foods. Her company, Silva Group, is now one of the strongest food service corporations in all of Zambia. In 2001, Sylvia's husband, Hector, left a successful executive career to join Sylvia's expanding company. She made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Since we're also getting on in life, I thought provided a good opportunity for us to grow old together. Enjoy. In 2010, the World Bank named Zambia one of the world's fastest economically reformed countries. Today, the people of Zambia are improving their lives in real and tangible ways. It was not always so. For over 70 years, the region was colonized by the British. Zambia became an independent country in 1964. The average African Zambian did their business on a sack in front of a store. They weren't allowed to be in the store, they had to be outside. So when the country became independent, the average Zambian didn't have any kind of economic business training. Uh, they had to learn it on the go. Since African culture was essentially tribal and community-based before colonization, many Zambians saw socialism as a return to their traditional way of life. Kenneth Kanda was head of the Socialist Party, UNIP, and was elected Zambia's first president. He soon banned all other political parties and for nearly 30 years maintained absolute power. During his tenure, illiteracy rose, communal farms failed, foreign investment lagged, and Zambia was drowning in debt. Leaders grew wealthy while the majority remained in poverty. The first government, our president was not very much encouraging workers to be business people. Even those who had businesses, we were doing it with a lot of fear. Finally, Konda was pressured to reinstate a multi-party democracy. And in 1991, Frederick Chiluba was elected president. Chiluba shifted policy to focus on small businesses, property rights, and the privatization of key industries. The transition was difficult and corruption widespread, but out of this, a new Zambia was born. Private sector were encouraged to participate, to engage in uh, businesses, and to be proud to own property. So that also helped Silver Catering, which was a private uh, organization, to start looking into other ways in which we could promote uh, ourselves as a company that was serious about contributing to the Zambian economy. In Zambia, there was a time when we had droughts for two years. And this is the period where we started receiving relief food. And uh, people became handicapped. I think the dependence syndrome was quite high because we were receiving food from the government. People did not want to go back to the land. 
they wanted to continue just receiving the foods. So this is what prompted us to say, what is it that we can do? We decided to open a new company called Silver Food Solutions. Sylvia and Hector Banda's new business would focus on the distribution of locally grown Zambian foods. But getting produce from farmers in the remote countryside proved a challenge, as was creating a process to maintain modern standards for food quality. Then Sylvia discovered the breakthrough concept. She would ask the farmers to dry their crops at their own farms, making the produce more practical to transport. She would offer them training on solar drying, along with classes on hygiene. Regional non-profits supported by foreign aid had offered such training in the past, but with little result. Judith Muila worked with such programs. They would pay the farmers a certain amount of money and offered to train them and teach them certain techniques of preserving foods. But obviously that was not a sustainable way of training the farmers because for as long as the farmers were doing it for the purposes of gaining some monies, they were not doing it for the interest of it and also they did not understand how useful this would be to their life-long skills. This time, a good crop with greater income would be the motivator. Farmers would not be paid for attending training sessions. But at the end of the season, if their produce passed inspection, Silva Group would purchase their entire crop. It was a major turnaround. Across all of Zambia, farmers who participated in Silvia's new program dramatically improved hygiene and output. I'm a farmer. I'm here in my field at Kande. Since I've been born, uh, this has been my field. There's rice, as well as maize, uh, vegetables, as well as mango. It's important to teach farmers how to preserve mango because you'll find the, during December, January, mango just go rotten. Farmers will have money in their pockets. So the mangoes, as well as the vegetables, really they will have money and hunger will not prevail. Before we began supplying things to Silver Foods, my husband and I were farmers doing small gardens. My education is quite humble, and my husband's education is quite humble. We heard about Silver Food Solutions and did the training, and then they would buy our vegetables. Our way of life has changed. Before that happened, our children never went to school. We tried for a bit of time, but we could not find the money to pay. But once we finally were able to sell our produce and grow even more, we were able to send all our children to school. Our life is very different now. When we train, we visit them to find out how they are doing. They encourage us quite a lot, especially when you are talking about children who are very young. And you have heard that they have gone back to school. You become very, very happy. Today, we find that most of the city has Zambian-owned shops and most of the trade that is taking place on a retail level is owned by indigenous Zambians. So we've seen Zambians move every decade up the ladder of success to more and more complex business activity. Through the liberalization of the economy, through the encouragement of government for people to own property, and this is what is called the economic empowerment, Zambians now more than ever before are taking charge of their lives, which was not there before. Zambians are doing it for themselves, and the future is very, very bright. Yeah. 
I'm here today to meet with the authors of the Economic Freedom of the World Report and to find out about their process of measuring countries like Zambia. Great to see you. Great to see you. Thank you for Gentlemen, here. thank you for joining me. What is this report and how does it work? Well, it's really an effort to view the world through the lens of, of opportunity and control over one's life. Uh, essentially, institutions and policies influence uh, the opportunities that individuals have in terms of choosing their own occupations, choosing entrepreneurial activities, engaging trades with people, and perhaps most importantly, the opportunity to keep what they earn. And we thought it would be interesting to see how those changes affect the economic freedom of people. So the idea was to try to quantify this. So we had to collect data on a lot of countries, data uh, from the World Bank, the IMF, other reputable sources. And then we put it all into the computer. We worked on it for many, many years. Jim had some health problems and lost his eyesight. So uh, that set us back a little bit. But we persevered. And after almost uh, seven or eight years, we finally came out with a good report. So you're basically looking at the kind of things that would give people power over their incomes, their wealth, their jobs, the freedom to start a business, to trade. Precisely, precisely. Our story continues in a divided land. Until the end of World War II, North and South Korea were one nation, one culture. Today, they are two drastically different countries. Dyson Kim knows both. When I escaped from North Korea, I was 27. I crossed the Jangbaekhyun River into China. There were too many North Korean security guards patrolling there. So I walked the mountain trails at night with no food for a week. I went hiding during the day and walked the trails at night again. In desperation, Dyson Kim fled North Korea. He had been trading goods across the border in China to provide for his parents and siblings, and had learned he was on a watch list for illegal trading. His life was in danger. He and his younger sister would have to flee. In the dark of the night, they crossed into China. I was not without fear. It was the fear of getting caught and eventually getting shot to death if brought back to North Korea and the fear of punishment to my family. Defectors who are caught and returned to North Korea face imprisonment, torture and often execution. Nearly 3,000 North Koreans escape to the South each year. I brought my younger sister with me. Unfortunately, in China we were separated. While I was away, someone kidnapped her. After losing my sister, I came to South Korea alone. Dyson hoped he could do more to find his sister from the safety of the South. When I first arrived in South Korea, I worked for a delivery service before enrolling in Hanguk University. While studying at the university, Dyson received a call from South Korean authorities. His younger sister had been found. My younger sister had managed to escape to South Korea. She told me that our older sister had also escaped and was living somewhere in China. So I arranged to bring my older sister here to South Korea too. One of the most repressive regimes in the world today, North Korea has maintained an aggressive policy of international isolation. A leading scholar on North Korea is Andrei Lankov. It's a very simple story in North Korea. It began as a Stalinist country, and in the late 50s it be decided to become hyper-Stalinist. They developed an economic model, which Joseph Stalin himself would probably find somewhat excessive. Everything was rationed. The government decided how much grain or soy sauce or cloth you should consume, depending on your place in the official hierarchy. This economy did not work. And when the Chinese and Russians stopped providing aid in the early 1990s, the North Korean economy essentially collapsed. 
The regime was unable to adapt. They could no longer provide the food on which its people had depended. Famine was widespread. It is estimated that at least half a million, and possibly as many as three million, North Koreans starved to death. There were times when I went without food for a whole week. During those days, my only dream was to eat a stomachful. When I came to South Korea, I saw food was plentiful. Nobody seemed to care about eating a stomachful. They have other dreams instead. How did this incredible contrast between North and South Korea come to be? For centuries, North and South were one unified country, living under the shadow of its three larger neighbors, Russia, China and Japan. In 1910, Japan claimed the Korean peninsula for itself and went on to occupy the region for 35 years. When Japan was defeated at the end of World War II, Korea was finally liberated by the Allies. But there were two visions of a post-war Korea a Soviet vision of a centrally planned economy to oversee the North, and an American vision of free enterprise to restructure the South. Eventually, the peninsula was split in two. Tensions remained high, culminating in the Korean War from 1950 to 1953. Most of the fighting was actually done on the South Korean side. A lot of it was destroyed. All of the industry that had been built up, that was all leveled. Everything you can see has been built over the last few decades and it began absolutely from the scratch. It was a country of unpaved road, ox carts, and such roofs just 40 or 50 years ago. For years following the war, South Korea was governed by a series of military dictators. The country languished in poverty. Then, in 1961, a new dictator came to power. General Park Chang-hee wanted to grow Korean industry and engineered nationwide economic liberalization. For the first time in Korean history, private property rights were truly protected. He liberalized markets more than they had ever been before. It made South Korean economy to explode, I mean, grow very rapidly in some year rate of increase of per capita income was more than 12 percent. The average growth was almost 9 percent per year. It was incredible. As South Korea developed its market economy, demands for legitimate political rights erupted. South Korea's first non-military president was sworn into office in 1992. If we look at history, a great deal of economic success stories happened under control of the authoritarian governments. Once modern economy starts to grow, it produces middle class. It produces people who are independent-minded, who don't want to be bossed around by a guy in the presidential palace or royal palace, who sooner or later begin to demand political participation. This is what happened in South Korea. It was a country of subsistence farms. It was transformed in 30 years, in one generation, into an extremely well-educated country of skilled workers, of professionals, of university students. And these people did not say thank you to the dictators. They said, enough. <laughs> Political democracy does not always guarantee economic freedom. Very often, the majority of the people want big government. Majority of the people want to tax the rich people and redistribute it among themselves. The name of that sentiment is the economic democracy. It's not economic freedom. So we have to be very careful about political democracy in order to protect economic freedom. After completing his university degree, 
Dyson Kim built a venture capital company with a focus on small businesses run by fellow refugees from the north. The North Korean defectors have no relatives in the south. They are mostly single and have no property. So borrowing money is the hardest thing for them and also the most important thing. Daisang meets regularly with the various owners to discuss business issues, cultural differences and basic moral support. North Korean refugees have many challenges. They often change their names in order to avoid arrest and reprisals to their relatives who are still living in the north. Then they find they are not so easily integrated into the south. Okbun and her family escaped from North Korea two years ago. I escaped with my husband, myself and two sons. Mr. Kim helped us with loans. That was how we got started. We figured that the plastic recycling business has a better competitive edge than other businesses. So we decided to take a risk by loaning them money. By no means is plastic recycling an easy business. My body aches all over. It is hard work. We hope to be in a situation to transfer an established factory to my son in the future. Yang Gum fled North Korea with her family in 2008. There was hardship in the beginning. A lack of capital was one thing. It's been almost a year now. We went through hard times, but we learned a lot. Just being here like this is a dream. In North Korea, survival itself was too tough, too tough. So I never dreamed of such things as I now have. I expect that someday North Korea will open her doors. When it does happen, the former North Korean defectors will be experienced business people backed with funds. Then we'll be able to play our roles in the reconstruction of North Korea. Daisang's venture capital company has funded 29 small businesses to date. My sisters are all engaged in running a business of their own. We all want to visit our parents' gravesite someday and want to play a role in helping North Korea become a wonderful country. Today, South Korea is ranked 37 in the Fraser Economic Freedom of the World Report, putting it in the top quarter of nations measured. North Korea is not included in the report due to a lack of reliable data. But we know that it is one of the world's least free economies. Guys, you've been using this report to rank countries for the past 17 years. What have you learned from the analysis of the data? Well, one of the most important things we've learned is that countries that are economically more free uh, grow more rapidly and achieve higher income levels. And in fact, not just a little bit higher income levels, but a lot higher income levels. For example, the uh, per person income of the highest quartile, the highest one fourth of economically free countries is seven times what the figure is for the lowest group. So that's a huge difference. But, it, but it's not just about uh, over rising incomes overall, it's also about the poorest of the poor. If we look at that bottom quartile, the poorest 10% of those societies have average incomes of about $1,200 per capita. If we look at the upper quartile, the most free quartile, they have average incomes of over $11,000. Now, that's not a lot to live on, but it's a whole lot more than $1,200. So as people work their way out of poverty, that's a substantial improvement in their quality of life. Uh, it's not just about the quality of life, it's about the quantity of life. If we look at the most free countries and compare them to the least free countries, the most free countries have substantially higher life expectancies, 18 years. You know, a lot of that relationship is probably driven by the fact that more free countries have higher incomes, better sanitation, nutrition, things like that. You know, if you live to be 80 versus 60, that's the difference between getting to know your grandkids see your grandkids grow up, see your great-grandchildren. Economic freedom is, is sure, it's about income, it's about growth, but it's also about quality of life and knowing your grandkids or not. And if you have more economic freedom, you have a better chance of knowing your grandkids. And that's more important or as important as how many cars are in the driveway and things like that. 
Our next story brings us to Eastern Europe. For 40 years, the small country of Slovakia was one of several Soviet-controlled nations held behind the Iron Curtain. At that time, Slovakia and the Czech Republic were united as one nation, called Czechoslovakia. In 1989, Czechoslovakia liberated itself from Soviet control. Virtually overnight, their communist nightmare had ended. But after independence, people struggled through the tumultuous years that followed. People like Olga Ruberakova and her children. The past regime, the communist regime, was very harsh for people living in this system. Especially for free and open-minded people. There weren't any opportunities for me, because as soon as you would stand out of the crowd a little bit, they were trying to put you down immediately. We weren't able to travel abroad freely. There was no freedom of speech, very limited opportunities. It was a true dictatorship. Olga Ryberakova lived the greater part of her life under communism. Throughout those brutal years, she struggled to provide for her two small children, Katarina and Eric. For a child uh, living in a Soviet Union, it was different because you didn't see all the politic, you know, of course you didn't care as a child, but if you grow thinking about all this more and more, uh, it was really not comfortable. And you know, the control was very, very tough. I know some stuff because uh, my mom was talking about it a lot. I didn't have the option to do what I wanted to do. So this is the, th the thing that I cannot imagine. People who have not experienced living in such a system can't imagine what it was like. From the collapse of communism through the uncertain years that followed, Eric and Katarina would grow up. As democracy was regained, Czechoslovakia experienced a brief period of celebration. But the economy had been devastated. Political corruption was widespread and unemployment was soaring. Slowly, the Czech region began to stabilize, but the Slovak region lagged farther behind. Then, in 1993, the two regions split into the Slovak Republic and the Czech Republic. Slovakia was now truly on her own. The communist leadership was blaming the imperialists, United States, capitalists, uh, all kinds of, you know, enemies that were cause of the failures of the communist system. There was finally no one to blame for our own mistakes. We were learning the lessons from these mistakes and we were also preparing the strategies how to be a more successful country. Ten years after democracy and freedom came to Slovakia, the country was still struggling. In 2001, unemployment was nearly 20%, the highest in all of Europe. The new nation had hit an economic wall. There were many situations when I would tell my kids it would be better because I had the feeling they are very capable people, they are fighters. But I was also telling them that maybe it would be better for them to leave the country. Even if we now lived in a free country, democratic country, there were many things I didn't like here. Well, it wasn't easy. It was really so bad, so I think that they, we should talk about it more. I have really bad feeling, and this is still inside in us because of what happened. Still, that we feel the freedom, but we are afraid of what happened uh, in the past. And this is really, really difficult. The Slovakian people made a dramatic change in direction. They voted for sweeping open market reforms, including a flat tax of 19% more flexible labor regulations, and privatization of their pension system. These changes were difficult, but within five years, business owners had newfound access to financing. The black market shrank, and foreign investment came into the country. Slovakia's unemployment dropped to 7.5%, and its standard of living increased dramatically. Economy started to perform, Slovakia made a transformation from the country that was lagging behind the neighbors 
Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, and that adopted two waves of serious economic reforms. These reforms put us ahead of the countries where we lagged behind in the 90s. That was our way how we catched up with the more developed countries. Slovakia had finally made the transformation from an Iron Curtain state to a thriving European nation. And starting one's own business also became a real possibility. Katarina Rybarikova had an idea. She would bring the growing Paul Frank brand with its distinctive monkey logo from America to Eastern Europe. It was almost six years ago. We didn't know uh, Paul Frank people, so I found some address online. I uh, googled a lot of stuff about Slovakia and um, all information they would be interested in. Okay, let's do a small presentation and we will see how it goes. Maybe they will be interested in Slovakia. So we flew to, to LA. Uh, we met uh, with owners and that's how we started. Now we are the only uh, official Paul Frank store in Europe. It was really so easy. Katarina has hired her brother, Eric, to manage product research in a growing business. Their mother, Olga, is the bookkeeper. Katarina is a fascinating person. And I'm not saying that just because she's my daughter. I'm very proud of her and Eric, of what they've achieved. And I'm happy to be a part of such a company. This is a family business. Uh, always we discuss about, you know, what could be the best. We have opinion also from our mom, which, you know, is different generation. That means you get different point of view on the product and we decide, you know, which one is the best and we go for it. The feeling is, is very good because you do it as a family together. What I feel now, it's definitely hard. It is difficult, but every job is difficult. Nothing is easy but the feeling on the end of the day is definitely the best. We're definitely growing, I would say, 30-40% up. Even if the market is shaky in Europe, I mean, we had so many problems with situation in Europe Union, but uh, it's still growing, so it's a good thing. In the communist regime, when my kids were small, I'd have never thought they could possibly achieve something like this. We have gone through three very fundamental transformation. One was the economic transformation from centrally planned economy to what I would call the market economy. Then there was this political transformation from a totalitarian state to the democracy including building the independent Slovakia. The most important transformation of all, which is the transformation from paternalism to individual responsibility. State paternalism has not only the ugly face of the communist rule, but it has a sort of very nice face of the social welfare state of the Western style. If you take responsibility from the individual citizens and companies to the state, then you end up in another version of socialism, which we proved that it is clearly unsustainable way of organizing the society. Now, you know, the monkey name is Julius. It wasn't famous in Slovakia at all. And now I can say, you know, people recognize Paul Frank, which the feeling is really good. Despite the fact that it can be hard even nowadays, the world problems, the European problems, I dare say that there is nothing better than democratic society and freedom. I'm happy that I live now and I didn't live before. After independence, Slovakia's earliest ranking on the Fraser Report was 81. By the year 2000, it had moved up just three places to 78. Then, after its economic reforms, it had leapt to 35. 
Now to see the impact of an even greater leap in economic freedom. We travel halfway around the world, to the west coast of South America, to the long, thin country of Chile. Despite its volatile political past, Chile is a stunning example of what can happen when a country embraces economic freedom. In 1975, Chile was next to last among all the countries ranked by the Fraser Report. Today, it is among the world's top 10 economically free countries, a ranking they have enjoyed since 2005. Bueno, esto nació el año... This idea was born as a result of our family's initiative to do something together to try to escape poverty. That's how we created this company. This partnership between brothers that started little by little. John Hernandez grew up in a small Chilean village. He went to work on a beekeeping farm to learn the trade. And after five years, he, his two brothers and sister, pooled their money to invest in their own beekeeping business. We walked into a business without knowing what to expect from the future. They would concentrate on honey production and pollination services for local farmers. Their business slowly began to grow, and eventually the bee farm could support their many growing families. Then, in 2005, there was a sudden decline in bee populations, jeopardizing crop pollination around the world. Nearly one-third of human food requires pollination from bees. Since then, the crisis has only worsened, with one-half or more of the bee population dying. The bee health situation was very bad, so we got serious about our professionalism. We were no longer peasant beekeepers that we were at the beginning. We had to turn our company around and incorporate technology. And to do that, we had to hire experts and bring them from abroad so we could be taught how to save our bees. We trained ourselves and educated our workers. But maintaining the health of his bees was not going to grow the business. John needed a new source of income. His research led him to a large French bee producer in desperate need of new hives. John's company began exporting queen bees, and even full hives, to France. Since Chile has one of the most open trade policies in South America, implementing this new source of income was not difficult. By producing queen bees for Europe, we generate income in the month of April, May and June month traditionally with no income for us. John and his family had made a new life for themselves and for others in their community. For his parents, such success would have been unthinkable. One leader of Chile's economic transformation was Hernán Busi. You have to look backwards and see how much poverty there was some time ago in Chile. There was a perception then by people that was convinced that the way out for a society was communist. In 1970, Chile elected a new president. Salvador Allende was the candidate of both the socialist and communist parties. Allende took immediate and controversial steps to implement a centralized economic system fully controlled by the government. A strong percentage of the population legitimized violence as a form of resolving political differences. Allende was the founder of one of the organizations for the promotion of revolution in Latin America. And the expansion of the economic activities of the state were done not by law, not through parliament, but simply by taking over. They actually wanted to destroy the market as a way of taking over politically, and then you have the power, because when you take the market, then you have the power. Allende nationalized all businesses. He took over farms larger than 200 acres and sent armed militia to commandeer the mining companies as well as many small family-owned stores. He greatly increased government social programs to aid the poor. But the economy was in chaos and his government could not fund the programs they had created. 
In just one month, inflation soared to 22%. And in 1973, Chile's Supreme Court unanimously denounced Allende's actions as unconstitutional. In September of 1973, General of the Army Augusto Pinochet led a coup d'etat against the Allende government. As the army moved in, Salvador Allende committed suicide. In less than a day, a military junta controlled Chile and Pinochet was proclaimed president. It is estimated that under his regime, 3,000 people were killed and another 25,000 were imprisoned or tortured, including women and children. A dramatic monument to the disappeared stands today to remind Chileans of that terrible period. But there is a great paradox within Pinochet's rule. Many generals wanted the military to control the economy as well. But instead, Pinochet invited outside experts to try and save the collapsing system. He handed over the restructuring of the country's economy to a group of young graduates of the University of Chicago, students influenced by the Nobel laureate Milton Friedman. They became known as the Chicago Boys. The Chicago influence in Chile was relevant because it created a new a brand of economists, more modern, trained economists, people that uh, believed in free markets and a free society. That kind of things were a novelty at the beginning of the 70s in Latin America and in Chile. Chile implemented an open trade policy, returned businesses to private ownership and privatized the pension system. Although a difficult transition, the economy began to improve, soon growing at an unprecedented rate, and the world took notice. Competitive imports mean Chilean manufacturers have to raise productivity and quality or go to the wall. Statistics indicate that 130 Chilean businesses did go bankrupt in the first quarter of 1980. Businesses ranging from large factories to small neighborhood stores. But at the same time, there are indications that industrial and agricultural production nationwide is slowly increasing. There is no shortage of customers for the wide range of goods on sale at reasonable prices. Although economic freedom had been achieved, political freedom would not be realized until 1991. Pinochet finally authorized an election and was defeated. He stepped down, although the legacy of his brutality lives on. This economy is the only way in which the poor can overcome their situation. And that we have seen in Chile 100%. And you can have social mobility, which in Chile didn't exist. 3% of the population went to university. Today, we have nearly 40%. 75% is the first generation that's going to university. To me, that's a much fairer country than the one that existed when I was little. Over the past three decades, Chile has transformed itself. Its poverty rate was then 40%. Today, it is 14%. Extreme poverty in Chile has dropped from 16% to 3%. And now, there are several independent programs designed to promote and support entrepreneurial activities among the poor. Veronica Creroso is a participant in one such program. My name is Veronica Creroso, and my micro factory is Fibras Diseños de Hogar. We manufacture loom, weaved, and felt objects. We make rugs, throws, and cushions. And we are planning on making curtains and sheets in the future, all home decor. Veronica and her family live below the poverty line in Viña del Mar, in an encampment of simple homes. Electricity is unofficially taken from the street. Water comes from the community cisterns, and there is no sewer system. We started to do capacitations. 
Uh, we began training and we were there for over a year learning how to weave on a loom, to make felt, uh, to sew and select materials. Learning how to manage a microfactory. So far we have made 20,000 pesos we have saved. With that money we will buy some wool to make a rug that was ordered. Today, Veronica and her partners are moving into their new workshop. We want to prove that even though we live in an encampment, we can do it. We want to have more income and at the same time make our business grow so we can employ our own people, all of those that live here at the encampment. That is why we decided to do our workshop right here where we live. We have three children we have to send to school, and we have to make efforts for their sake. We fight for them. I'm giving them something better than what my parents could give me. Beekeeper John Hernandez is also working hard to create a better life for his family. He believes he can help America's problem with dying bees. But the United States has strict import regulations that forbid the importation of bees from South America. They need bees. That's what we are working for right now, negotiating that. In the meantime, he remains appreciative of the business he has from Europe. Today's situation is so different. For sure, a lot has changed in my life. For over 30 years, the United States was around third place. But in this latest report, the U.S. is at 19. Why? What happened? Well, the biggest single factor contributing to the U.S. decline is the decline in the legal structure area and protection of property rights. From the wars on drugs and terror to the more widespread use of eminent domain to take property from one party and transfer it to another, to the auto bailout, which tended to undermine the property rights of, of bondholders. Well, generally, the Economic Freedom Index is showing a rise of economic freedom around the world, but only a handful of countries are decreasing. Some people object to economic freedom because they think it's just freedom for the well-off, for the big businesses and for those who already have power. What's your take on that? I think if you look at the U.S. Uh, in response to kind of the financial crisis, what did we get? We got greater concentration in the banking industry. It's harder to be a local uh, bank, local savings and loan. Um, uh, the banking interests and banking lobbyists used the, the opportunity uh, by the financial crisis to solidify uh, their position in the marketplace. Uh, that's not economic freedom, right? That's antithetical to economic freedom. All those lobbyists that those corporations hire and they send to the national capital, they're not arguing for more economic freedom, they're arguing for less, they're arguing for, arguing for special privileges. Oppression of economic freedom, it's kind of subtle and it goes under the radar and uh, fewer people notice it. And that's what makes it uh, very difficult to uh, defend. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing about this uh, Economic Freedom of the World Report. It makes these trends visible. It tells us where to look. It gets us talking about it. And that's why we do this. That's why you do this. That's why I write about it. That's why we talk about it. Guys, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your work on this. Thank you. Thank you. In my years researching this topic, I've seen example after example where people's lives have improved for the better because they had economic freedom. It may be the most powerful force I know for empowering people and creating conditions for poverty reduction and national prosperity. For Sylvia and Hector Banda, economic freedom has sparked the creation of several innovative businesses resulting in new jobs and healthier foods for thousands of their countrymen. For Dyson Kim, it has presented the opportunity to serve his fellow North Korean refugees who are building a new life in a new country. John Hernandez is contributing to the worldwide fight against a declining bee population, while Katarina Ruberikova has embraced the entrepreneurial spirit and brought prosperity to many others. And for Veronica Krirso, economic freedom has provided hope 
that life will be better for herself and her family. These people are the heroes of our time, working hard to transform their lives and their communities. For them, economic freedom is not some academic concept or economic abstraction. It's food on their tables. It's a future for their children. It's the ability to enjoy the fruits of their labor. And ultimately, it's the power that we all desire to control our own lives. Major funding for this program was provided by Donald and Paula Smith Family Foundation. Additional funding was provided by David and Annette Jorgensen Foundation and Chris and Melody Roofer. Economic Freedom in Action is available on DVD. For more information or to order a DVD of this program, call 1-800-876-8930 or visit www.freetochoose.net.